Well, life, <laughs> it happens each and every day to each and every one of us. Um, even though our lives look different, we all live life every day until Jesus comes back <laughs> or decides to take us home. Um, every lady here is representation of a life lived, no matter what kind of um, um, no matter what kind of family, no matter how many children, no matter if you're married or unmarried, no matter if you're younger or older, each and every one of us is a representation of a life lived. And as we walk our individual paths through this life, there is one um, common cord and one common thread that is woven through us all. And that, the word tells us, is troubles and trials. And we can expect things um, to come in our lives um, the word tells us that they could be big, they could be small, but in this life, because of sin that entered this world, you know, at the very beginning, because of that sin, we will have troubles and we will have trials, and we don't always have control of what happens to us, but we are in control of how we react to those events in our lives. James tells us in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, um, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Verse 3, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance has fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. In verse 2, it tells us, um, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity. So, if we would start viewing those troubles and those trials that comes in our, come in our lives as opportunity, I believe we can see things a little differently. You have a sick kid. Oh, it's an opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity of this sick kid. The car breaks down. It's an opportunity. A coworker questions your faith or accuses you of immorality that you know is not true about you. It's an opportunity. You lose your job, maybe as a result of that, maybe about something different. Who knows? But it's an opportunity. Your marriage could hit a rough and, and kind of a, a rough patch. It's an opportunity. Or you get unfavorable results to a blood test. It's an opportunity. An opportunity for what, you say? Those sound like really terrible things. <laughs> it's an opportunity for joy, one. In verse 2, it says, when they come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Not just joy, great joy. Those troubles and those trials, if we would start viewing them as an opportunity for great joy in our lives. It's an opportunity for faith. In verse 3, at the first part, it says um, that when your faith is tested. So that tells me those trials and those tribulations, they call an opportunity for my faith to be put into action. Faith is not faith until it's put to action. Right? Right. It is an opportunity for growth. At the second part of that, it says, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. It's an opportunity to, to bring about growth in your life and to test your endurance and to, to really help it build and grow. And lastly, it's an opportunity to react. Verse 4 says, let it grow. Your reaction to let it happen. Um, your reaction in trying situations greatly determines the outcome. I'll say it again. It's up on the screens. Your reaction to trying situations greatly determines the outcome. You know, in every situation, there can be two ways. These are just the two I'm going to highlight, but... We can, we can kind of lump some our reactions in two ways. And James chapter 1, right after that, that first part when we read about all those trials and letting our faith be put to action and consider it, you know, those opportunities for great joy and, and really building that endurance in us and, and helping us grow. Right after that, in verses 5 through 8, it says, If you need wisdom, so... That kind of tells us those trials and tribulations come, so guess what? We're going to need wisdom in the way to react. But it says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Verse 6, but when you ask, 
Be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. In verse 8, their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Well, behind me is my prop. And my partner is here to help me this evening. <laughs> a couple months ago, I was reading, and actually, it happened to be um, on a Sunday morning when we, like on the Saturday when we did the outdoor services, and then we, we went to um, different area churches a time or two. We actually just kept our kids home and did our own little church thing and, and really poured into our kids. But we were sitting outside. I remember it just vividly. We were sitting on the porch just reading scripture. And as I read this scripture, I could just see this teeter-totter. And I started jotting these notes, and I said, Jason, look. And really, the original was, you know, the plastic, like, rounded bottom. They're just like this big little teeter-totters for little ones. And I envisioned this person on this teeter-totter. I'm like, this is so cool. So I had this idea for this message, and I said, I'm going to get one of these. And he said, no, you need a big teeter-totter. <laughs> I said, what? Where am I going to get a big teeter-totter? He said, I'll make it. But then he just had Randy make it. <laughs> But Randy did an awesome job. Thank you, Randy. And they even had the parking guys. I sent them out to eat. But I can just see through this teeter-totter, there are two ways we can react. And the first would be rest, to just take a seat. Yeah, I'm ready. We practice this. <laughs> but rest says, God, I need you. Can't do this alone. I'm going to take my seat right here with Jesus. He's not Jesus. <laughs> but a few weeks ago, he did preach a message about taking our seat. You know, God has seated us in heavenly places with Jesus. This is fun. <laughs> Are you guys getting dizzy watching us? <laughs> but, you know, he has, he has seated us, and we should not give up our seat, right, in the kingdom. But here we are. We're taking our seat with Jesus. We're letting him lead and guide us. Um, where we allow God to take control of the situation, and we just sit here and rest in what he has for us. You are not responsible for what happens. Jesus is kind of controlling this over here in your life. <laughs> We're just resting and trusting in him. And even though you're resting in him, you are still actively putting your faith in him. Um, and, you know, sometimes it can seem like this is a really unbalanced way, but we are just moving. You can, you can put me down a minute. Yeah, put me down a minute. I'm going to tell like, down. Yeah, put me. You weigh too much? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're just a little unbalanced. <laughs> but, okay, you, you seem like you're in this valley, like, really low. Well, this is an opportunity for you to exercise your faith in your leg muscles. But there's scripture that says, encourage yourself in the Lord. So it calls to action for you to actually, put me down just a little bit farther because I got to, okay. And you put the weight on yourself and encourage yourself ah, and see what he does for you. And he lifts you up to this place. Okay, now, now leave me up here a minute. <laughs> so here we are. No, you feel like you're up here and you're all alone and you're dangling and you're dangling and you're dangling. But guess what? He is your weight. And he is still in control. And he will not leave you there too long all by yourself because he's still the one. And something else, when you're right here, you see Jesus. He is your focus. Not your problem, but you are trusting him and relying on him to take control in every situation because you are resting in him. This is what I call a God-centered reaction to rest. God, just picture God in the middle. This is me and Jesus, and God is in the middle as the control of the situation. Okay, that's all I need for, oh, you better stay here just a minute. <laughs> the other reaction could be, and it could be a little more, um, it could be a little more, uh, what do I want to say, easy or just a little more knee-jerk reaction because it's harder to rest, to actually rest in God and to trust him. This other one would be um, a reaction of control. Okay, this situation has happened, so here I am. I am going to take control of this situation myself. Not a God-centered, 
but this is a self-centered reaction where you say, guess what, I'm going to step into the sinner's ring and I'm just going to take care of this problem. Whatever this trial or this tribulation, I'm going to be right here and I'm going to handle this. But guess what? then all that responsibility falls on you. You feel responsible if you can't control it. Things are coming your way, and you're feeling really unstable, as the scripture said. You know, someone with divided loyalty, they don't know if it's about them or about God. They don't know if they should trust God or not, and they're, they're moving back and forth, and it's like, holy cow, I can't do this. All this stuff's coming my way, and I can't, I can't balance everything because it's really unstable. There's nothing, my, my faith is not in God alone. It's in me and, and how I am controlling this situation. You can lose hope. You struggle to find the strength because you're getting really tired. There's no one to balance you out. You say, God, take control of this situation, but you don't relinquish the control, and he can't really help you because it's a self-centered control knee-jerk reaction. You're going to help me down so I don't... Uh, okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> So our rest, we can ask God, like the scripture says, you can ask him for wisdom. It's a God-centered reaction where you rest in him, ask him for wisdom, what to do. Ask him to lead you and to guide you and take control of that situation. A control is that of wavering faith and your divided loyalty is, do I need to control this? Does God need to control this? And the scripture says that we are so unstable in trying to control it ourselves and rely on things of the world and ourselves to control it that we can't expect to receive anything from God. That's what the scripture in, in James tells us. We can all get into unstable situations with trials and tribulations in this life. Um, and we can try to take care of those things, those troubles on our own. And when we do that, we think that we can balance our lives. And it is, it, a lot of times I hear people say, I just, I just need to find balance in my life. I need, to, I need to find a way to bring balance. But I don't believe it's about balance at all. Um, I actually even saw a post, a social media post from um, a lady that was doing a message that said, the Bible never speaks of balance, but it does speak of leverage. And using those situations, we need to leverage every situation with our faith in him and trust him, and that's what this was. When we were leveraging that strength in our legs and relying on him to move us in those situations and to lead and to guide us, it's about trusting him to take care of us. And it may look unbalanced, you know, when you're going up and down like this, but really that's the most balanced because he is in control. When you're in the middle, that's not really balance. People throw things your way and you got more trials coming your way and you, you try to juggle it and that's when you come really unbalanced because you can't handle it all. When we learn to move and adapt with the ebb and, ebb and flow, <laughs> as, as you will, we are avoiding abrupt situations that can upset our balance. When we learn to move with God. A couple weeks ago, Jason and I went to... Um, a church called the Experience Church, or a round table. I don't know if you, they literally put the, the tables like kind of in a circle, and it's just question and answer with different pastors and, and leaders, and we just talk about stuff, and it's really cool. But that has nothing to do with it. It's just the fact that we were going there. <laughs> but we were on our way, and we got our coffee. And he has recently got a new used truck, and he, he did the man thing, and he got wheels and tires and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So the thing rides like a log wagon. I mean, he, <laughs> he said, guess what, babe? I'm going to get you a massage today. We're going to drive all the way to Bridgeport in my truck. And it's <laughs> but that's what it was, and we were both trying to hold our coffee, and it was like bouncing, and I'm like, I can't ride like this all the way there. He said, no, just watch this. He said, every time you hit a bump, you just move your cup, and it doesn't spill out. So here I am trying to hold my coffee, and it's spilling everywhere, and he's just going like this, and his coffee's not going anywhere. But isn't that such a picture of just moving with God instead of trying to control our cup and hold it really still when all these things are coming, and our life is spilling out everywhere? If we would just learn to move with God when he moves, he's really in control, and then we avoid those abrupt situations that will like totally knock us off balance, and then you don't get burnt with, with hot coffee. <laughs> a God-centered resting life will bring maturity to us. Um, whether it's through trials and tribulations that we've been talking about. The scripture, um, the book of James even talks about in wisdom and speech, how we talk about things, how we react to things, um, how we 
how we say things, just the way we think and we act and our wisdom and our speech, it will bring maturity if we learn to trust God and, and put him at the center of our life and quit trying to control everything. It can help us in our wealth and poverty view, you know, what we have and what we don't have. You know, sometimes that can really upset us, trying to get it all. Or there's another, another view that, you know, Christians aren't supposed to have something, you're supposed to give it all away. And, you know, that can really, that can really upset our you know, internal balance, if you will, just trying and trying and trying. If we would get that God-centered life and trust him, you know, with whatever comes our way, whatever we think and what we say, and we ask him for that wisdom, as, as James tells us, and what we have and what we don't have. If we just trust him to give us what we need, you know, the scripture tells us he takes care of the sparrow. Why would he not take care of us, the ones who he created? There is life and there's reactions there's um, rest and there's control. Life can throw so many things our way, and we can't control those things, but our reaction is in our control. The way we see things, if we choose to have a God-centered rest or a self-controlled or a, a self-centered kind of control, it will determine the outcome, whether we allow God to move in us or whether we try to take control and do things ourselves. Will I allow God to work and move in me? Because the scripture says that he works all things for good to those who love him and who trust him and who put their faith in him to take care of it. That's why he died for us, so that we didn't have to do it on our own, so we could love him and put our trust and ultimately tell others about him. So I just want to have kind of a time of response. Um, you guys can turn the lights down if you want. But I'm just going to pray, and um, you guys can stand up. Just join me for just a minute, because we all have those situations in our life that it's like, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, I'm going to try to control this. But does that work? Mm, not always. What works is putting our faith and our trust in him because he is the one who knows our beginning from our end. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He knows every breath that we take. He knows every hair that is on our head. So why would he not want the best for us? We try to take control of those things ourselves, and we just, we just end up with a spilled cup of coffee, <laughs> if you will. Or we end up trying to stand and balance our life, and we, we, we go back and forth. And really, if we would just rest in him, if we would take our rightful seat, he would take care of us. So we all have those things in our lives. If we could just bow our heads and say, search me, God. Search every part of me, whether I have reacted correctly or whether I have not. You know, we don't have a guarantee that this life will be perfect we have a guarantee by the word that we will have trials. So God help us in every trial and tribulation of life. Everything, every crossroads we come to, every decision, Lord God, I pray that you would put that within us. Let that strength well up within us to trust you no matter what. Because you are the one who is in control. God, I pray for every situation that is represented in the lives of these ladies here. God, I pray that you would move in and out of the hearts of the, in the seats of these ladies work and move on us, Lord God. Strengthen our faith. Let us see things as an opportunity, an opportunity to trust you, an opportunity for great joy, Lord God, to see things differently, an opportunity to rest and not try to control everything, Lord God. Put that strength within us and help each and every one here. Help us to be changed by this word, Lord God, and that we would not leave this place unchanged. I pray for your blessings upon each and every lady here. And we just give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.